Support for The Power of Words comes from the New York State Archives Partnership Trust, helping to preserve more than 380 years of New York's documentary heritage. www.nysarchives.org New York State Council for the Humanities, online at nyhumanities.org and EYP Architecture and Engineering, committed to preserving and restoring our nation's most prominent landmark facilities www.eypae.com or 518-431-3300. Words are powerful. They cause fear, confusion, and anger, or they can create shared understanding. But when words are delivered by a powerful political leader, their impact can inspire us to great action. And it is to those words that we turn now. In the power of words. not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. This is the meaning of our liberty and our creed, why men and women and children of every race and every faith can join in celebration across this magnificent mall, and why a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served at a local restaurant, can now stand before you to take a most sacred oath. Hi, this is Alan Chartok. Welcome to The Power of Words, our year-long series that follows American history through some of the most memorable and inspiring political speeches of our time. Our series continues today with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt's Declaration of Human Rights speech delivered in Paris, France on December 9, 1948. Joining us today to help set the scene and analyze the speech is Dr. Alita Black. Dr. Black is a professor of history and international affairs at the George Washington University. Dr. Black is also project director and editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers, a project designed to preserve, teach, and apply Eleanor Roosevelt's writings and discussions of human rights and democratic politics and research. Dr. Black has written a number of publications, which include the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers, Volume 1, The Human Rights Years, 1945 to 1948, Casting Her Own Shadow, Eleanor Roosevelt and the Shaping of Postwar Liberalism, What I Want to Leave Behind, Democracy and the Selected Articles of Eleanor Roosevelt, Courage in a Dangerous World, The Political Writings of Eleanor Roosevelt, and with Jewel Fenzi, Democratic Women, an Oral History of the Women's National Democratic Club, and is working on a political bio of Eleanor Roosevelt. Outside the classroom, Professor Black has written teacher's guides for PBS documentaries and served as an advisor to other documentaries prepared for PBS, the History Channel, A&E, and the Discovery Channel. Professor Black is also a member of the board of directors of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute and has received many other accolades and awards, too numerous to mention. Welcome, Alita Black. Thanks, Alan. I'm so happy to be here, especially to talk about Eleanor in what I call Roosevelt land. <laughs> We're delighted you're here. You are such an expert on Eleanor Roosevelt. In my house, this is one worshipped woman. What is it about her that has maintained such an incredible interest in this woman over the years? Well, Eleanor, I think, shows us what we can become if we really have guts to practice what we preach. She was in many ways, I think, the quintessential American for the 20th century without trying to sound like some pompous academic. I mean, if, if you look at the challenges that she faced, I mean, she grappled with alcoholism. She was orphaned at an early age. And her life really touched on all the major issues that defined us as a nation. Not only the First World War, the Second World War, and the Korean War, but also the emerging women's movement, the emerging civil rights movement. I mean, what's going to happen to our country when our economy is totally and completely in the toilet? I mean, do we turn on each other like every other country in the nation has done in the history of the world when their economy went this bad? Or do we really say, I'm not going to go down that road and I am not going to be afraid? And so I think to the extent that we have confronted fear in this country, we've had Eleanor in our soul, and people understand that. You know, they relate to her. They can put their own hopes and aspirations and their own personal experiences and their own fears on her and say, well, my God, if she got through it, I can too. 
So uh, what is it about her that sort of identified her importance? I guess a lot of people want to know, was she a thinker in her own right? Was she, as some people have said, the eyes and ears of Franklin Roosevelt? After Franklin Roosevelt's death, did she become more important as a fixture in American politics? What's the deal? Well, I think that people who want to characterize Eleanor Roosevelt solely as Franklin Roosevelt's eyes and ears have the brains of a squashed pea. <laughs> I hope that's clear enough. But um, clear. Eleanor, <laughs> Eleanor <laughs> grew in her own right um, as a political thinker, as a strategist, as um, a communicator of very complicated ideas. And she was a master at concealing her own influence. I mean, in fact, um, as much as I have unbridled respect for this woman, and I do believe that she is the best democracy has to offer, this woman lied. I mean, she went to her grave saying that she never changed FDR's mind on any issue, that she really wasn't political, that she was just one of the ones who served his purposes. I mean, give me a break. This woman understood the fundamental rule of political power, and that is in order to exercise power and to keep people at the table, don't take credit for the work that you want accomplished. Share it so that everybody buys into it and you can actually get something done. And so Eleanor learned this really at a very early age and began to modify it throughout her life. And so she was a political operative of the first order. And I think that you could very clearly and historically uh, accurate, with with historical accuracy, argue that Eleanor Roosevelt truly was the first community organizer to live in the White House. Wow. Um, Did, uh, did, uh, can you give us any proof of what you've just said? Okay, well, I'll give you three. Let's take one from the 1920s. Eleanor helped organize the Democratic Party of New York State with such finesse that when Al Smith was trying to convince FDR to, in fact, run for governor in 1928, Al Smith, who was then the governor of New York, as all your listeners know, wrote Bell Moskowitz, his chief aide, and said, and I quote, We must have Franklin because his wife, Eleanor, is more well-known among the party faithful and party activists than anyone in the state, close quote. She had organized so carefully in different campaigns that she kept note cards of when she had door-to-door visits when people... listed their objections to specific candidates and the issues they concerned about. Eleanor wrote them down. She got the issues addressed. She brought the material back. She went to see them. If they still had objections, she went back, got the information, came back and saw them again. She was a master voter registrar trainer. She helped organize people in early door knocking campaigns, so much so that by 1928, she edited and was the master communicator for not only the Democratic Party of New York State, but the Democratic Party of the United States of America. So I'd say she had some political skills in her own right. And that was just in the 20s without any um, of the uh, expertise that she picked up during the gubernatorial years when she uh, was sent by her husband, then the governor, to um, convey his rebuke to Tammany Hall. You certainly don't send a wuss to go tell the major political boss in New York State that they've got to behave. And then she began to organize Um, a message campaign within the White House that really helped dramatically in the 1936 election. So Eleanor was first and foremost a political war horse, and that's why Franklin was still alive. Uh, There was a cartoon that I always remember in the New Yorker, I believe, uh, that showed her in West Virginia, and there was a miner, I believe, coming out of the mine and said, here comes Eleanor again. 
Yeah, it's it, it's a very famous cartoon, and and the tagline I may say with a friendly I hope tweak sure. is uh, for gosh sakes it's Mrs. Roosevelt, uh-huh. and that cartoon was really meant to mock her, as opposed to um, praise her, because going into a cold mine at that point was a very very dangerous. Uh, life-risking occupation. Working as a coal miner now is incredibly dangerous. But in the 1930s, without all of the the safety devices that the miners today have, I mean, people were saying, what in God's sake is she going down there doing? I mean, she's butting into somebody else's business again. She's risking her life. She's putting her nation in peril. I mean, get a grip, Eleanor. And so my, and that became such a controversial cartoon that Eleanor had to respond with um, a Saturday Evening Post article saying that, you know, everybody wants to criticize me for being curious. But leaders have to be curious, and leaders and responsibilities in perilous times have to take risks in order to understand what the needs of the constituents are. So as long as I am a Democrat with a little d and have um, a national responsibility with a capital D, I'm going to continue to find out what my fellow citizens need. And so keep looking for me because I'm going to show up. Did Franklin send her? Or did she initiate these trips herself? Oh, she initiated these trips on herself. Actually, I need to clarify that. People ask her to come. Eleanor Roosevelt, like her husband, got unprecedented mail. Let me just give you one statistic. After August 31st, 1933, when she had been in the White House less than six months, she writes an article entitled, I Want You to Write to Me. And basically what she says is we don't know if the New Deal's working unless you tell us how it's affecting your day-to-day life on the ground. We can't be everywhere. So I want you to write to me. I want you to tell me what's working, what's not working. I want you to tell me what your needs are. I don't know the answers, but I can promise you that, in fact, I will send them to the appropriate people in the government who are charged with developing policy to address your concerns. And so when that article appears in August 31st, within the next four months, Eleanor Roosevelt gets 300,000 letters. Now, let me put this into perspective. Nobody had ever gotten 300,000 letters. Teddy Roosevelt didn't get 300,000 unsolicited letters. Woodrow Wilson didn't. Abraham Lincoln didn't. And Eleanor Roosevelt got them in four months, and everybody got an answer. This is unprecedented in the history of the White House. This is before the auto pen. This is before you have computer-generated letters. And so Eleanor really took the concerns of her correspondence very clearly. You know how President Obama now reads 10 letters a night before he goes to bed? Eleanor Roosevelt read 200. And of those, she selected the respondents that she wanted to meet, that she wanted to travel to, and the more she traveled, and she traveled 40,000 miles the first year in the White House, the more people wanted her to come. And so she took that as her job description, to go out and investigate not only for the president, not only for the Roosevelt administration, but first and foremost for the country to show them that, in fact, the government was paying attention to their concerns and that we must combat what Eleanor would call the politics of fear so that we can figure out how to get out of this mess and become the nation that we can be. Now, she also had a newspaper column. Yes, she wrote a column entitled My Day, which started in January 1st, 1936, and would end in September 1962. Whoa. It is the it is the longest syndicated political column in the history of the United States. It's I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt today would put at put George Will, Maureen Dowd, Gail Collins, Arianna Huffington, Rush Limbaugh to shame. There are eight thousand three hundred and sixty two columns. And she wrote them all on- of which she wrote herself. Amazing. 
There is always the issue of Eleanor and Franklin's relationships. And how much can you separate the political and the, you know, sociological marriage issues? Well, I leave the marriage to people who want to dabble in speculation. What I can say with a clear conscience and historical accuracy is that they both helped each other very much become the political giants that they became. And in the process, they learned to love each other in new, more encompassing and respectful ways. And it's very clear to me that what the Roosevelts had with each other was an ability to see each other as individuals, to learn to love each other in new ways, and to also sacrifice their own personal freedoms and individual wants for the needs of the country. Because everybody wants to talk about Eleanor's speech in 1940, that this is no ordinary time. I mean, you could say that the whole Eleanor Franklin Roosevelt relationship occurred over periods of no ordinary time, one crisis after another. And so I think they are great giants in their ability to continue to learn to work together for the good of the country in spite of personal disappointments and letdowns. Okay, so we have some time now before we go into this speech, and we have chosen this speech before the UN on the Declaration of Human Rights. So set it up for us. As I read the speech, the Soviet Union at the time played a significant role in what she was talking about. Can you tell us what it was all about? Sure. The speech that Eleanor gives on the floor of the General Assembly, many people consider her greatest remarks. I have huge trouble with that. And the interest of full disclosure is, is that Eleanor did not write these remarks. These are one of the three speeches that Eleanor did not write that she gave her entire life. This speech had to be vetted by the State Department, had to be vetted by the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, and in some cases had to be vetted by the U.N. Third Committee, which is the Committee on Social, Humanitarian, and Cultural Concerns. People look at this speech because it is the speech Eleanor gave the night of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which she rightfully considered her greatest accomplishment. But the speech is fraught with Cold War language that Eleanor traditionally did not use. What we have here is the culmination of two years of meetings, meetings that were incredible to witness. And I can say this as somebody who has been a historical voyeur, for lack of a better term. I spent years of my life reading every committee record, every private letter about these meetings, and every transcript, every verbatim transcript of every discussion involved with crafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And what you see there is Eleanor's ability to keep this ever-changing committee of 18, people who did not agree on God, people who did not agree on private property, people who did not agree on marriage or the form of government or what the purpose of government was, what are citizens, what is the right to travel, who has human rights. I mean, the most fundamental issues that we in America take for granted. I mean, some people on this committee didn't even deal in cash. So you've got to come to terms with what do we all share in common? What image can we create? What virtual call to the barricades of human rights can we generate to stand in opposition to the horrors of the Holocaust? You know, we are just then beginning to see the photographs of the Holocaust. We are just beginning to see what a world with 40 million deaths from war would be like. We are just beginning to see a world with 40 million refugees. I mean, the world is in crisis. Today, we look at it and we say, oh, my God, it's the typical Cold War. The United States won the war with help from the Allies, but their economy is still standing. And you have Stalin and the monolithic Soviets on the other side. Yes, that's true. 
But in the middle, there is a huge crisis that is destabilizing the world. And what Eleanor Roosevelt contributed as chair of the drafting committee for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as chair of the Human Rights Commission, as an active member of Committee 3, the Committee on Social, Humanitarian, and Cultural Concerns, is a very basic, fundamental, and vibrantly essential image. And that is what a free world can be like. And so when Eleanor strides to that podium in the General Assembly in Paris to present the Declaration, she has masterfully worked every employee, every member of every delegation in the UN, including those who objected to human rights, including the Soviets. She had already won a major debate with Andre Vashinsky on refugees and the right to repatriation. She had already gone head to head with Gromyko and won. And what she understands before she strides to that podium is all of the work that she has done to keep the Soviets from objecting to the Declaration. Because this Declaration had to be adopted unanimously by the United Nations for it to have power. If the Soviet bloc had objected to it, it would have had no power. And so what Eleanor did was patiently negotiate with the Soviets and the satellite nations to keep them in line. And in order to do that, she just magnificently convinced the United States, and I'm talking such quote-unquote pushovers, I'm being sarcastic here so you won't get letters, people like George Marshall, Harry Truman, Secretary Lovett, I mean, people who are giants in their own right to say, listen, human rights are not just political and civil rights. They are not just the right to vote, the right to worship, the right to speak out. They are not just the right to organize. They are, in fact, also social, economic, and cultural rights. They are the right to work for wages. There's the right to join unions. There's the right to food, the right to shelter, the right to marry. If we have to have a declaration that embraces those. And so what she was able to do was push a very reluctant United States to say that economic and social and cultural rights are human rights so that not only because she believed that herself, this is what she believes, after all, that freedom from want, one of FDR's four great freedoms, means. And this was her ability to keep the Soviets from objecting. And so against that backdrop, when she has done all her homework and all her masterful diplomatic negotiations, this is when she goes up before the United Nations and reads this address, which was written for her by the State Department. You're listening to The Power of Words, a co-production of WAMC and the Archives Partnership Trust. I'm Alan Shartok. We're here with Dr. Alita Black, Professor of History and International Affairs at the George Washington University and Project Director and Editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers. Okay, now that we've set the scene for First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt's Declaration of Human Rights speech, it's time to listen. The long and meticulous study and debate of which this Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the product means that it reflects the composite views of the many men and governments who have contributed to its formulation. Not every man nor every government can have what he wants in a document of this kind. There are, of course, particular provisions in the Declaration before us with which we are not fully satisfied. I have no doubt this is true of other delegations. And it would still be true 
if we continued our labors over many years. Taken as a whole, the delegation of the United States believes that this is a good document, even a great document, and we propose to give it our full support. The position of the United States on the various parts of the Declaration is a matter of record in the Third Committee. I shall not burden the Assembly, and particularly my colleagues of the Third Committee, with a restatement of that position here. I should like to comment briefly on the amendments proposed by the Soviet delegation. The language of these amendments has been dressed up somewhat, but the substance is the same as the amendments which were offered by the Soviet delegation in committee and rejected after exhaustive discussion. Substantially the same amendments have been previously considered and rejected in the Human Rights Commission. We in the United States admire those who fight for their convictions, and the Soviet delegation has fought for their convictions. But in the older democracies, we have learned that sometimes we bow to the will of the majority. In doing that, we do not give up our convictions. We continue sometimes to persuade, and eventually we may be successful. But we know that we have to work together, and we have to progress. So we believe that when we have made a good fight and the majority is against us, it is perhaps better tactics to try to cooperate. I feel bound to say that I think perhaps it is somewhat of an imposition on this assembly to have these amendments offered again here, and I am confident that they will be rejected without debate. The first two paragraphs of the amendment to Article 3 deal with the question of minorities, which Committee 3 decided required further study and has recommended in a separate resolution their reference to the Economic and Social Council and the Human Rights Commission. As set out in the Soviet amendment, this provision clearly states group and not individual rights. The Soviet amendment to Article 20 is obviously a very restrictive statement of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. It sets up standards which would enable any state practically to deny all freedom of opinion and expression without violating the article. It introduces the terms democratic views, democratic systems, democratic state, and fascism, which we know all too well from debates in this assembly over the past two years on warmongering and related subjects are liable to the most flagrant abuse and diverse interpretations. The statement of the Soviet delegate here tonight is a very good case in point on this. The Soviet amendment of Article 22 introduces new elements into the article without improving the committee text and again introduces specific reference to discrimination. As was repeatedly pointed out in Committee 3, the question of discrimination is comprehensively covered in Article 2 of the Declaration so that its restatement elsewhere is completely unnecessary and also has the effect of weakening the comprehensive principles stated in Article 2. The new article proposed by the Soviet delegation is but a restatement of state obligation which the Soviet delegation attempted to introduce into practically every article in the Declaration. 
it would convert the Declaration into a document stating obligations on states, thereby changing completely its character as a statement of principles to serve as a common standard of achievement for the members of the United Nations. The Soviet proposal for deferring consideration of the Declaration to the fourth session of the Assembly requires no comment. An identical text was rejected in Committee 3 by vote of six in favor and 26 against. We are all agreed, I am sure, that the Declaration, which has been worked on with such great effort and devotion and over such a long period of time, must be approved by this Assembly at this session. Certain provisions of the Declaration are stated in such broad terms as to be acceptable only because of the provisions in Article 30 providing for limitation on the exercise of the rights for the purpose of meeting the requirements of morality, public order, and the general welfare. An example of this is the provision that everyone has the right to equal access to the public service in his country. The basic principle of equality and of non-discrimination as to public employment is sound, but it cannot be accepted without limitation. My government, for example, would consider that this is unquestionably subject to limitation in the interest of public order and the general welfare. It would not consider that the exclusion from public employment of persons holding subversive political beliefs and not loyal to the basic principles and practices of the Constitution and laws of the country would in any way infringe upon this right. Likewise, my government has made it clear in the course of the development of the Declaration that it does not consider that the economic and social and cultural rights stated in the Declaration imply an obligation on governments to assure the enjoyment of these rights by direct governmental action. This was made quite clear in the Human Rights Commission text of Article 23, which served as a so-called umbrella article to the Articles on Economic and Social Rights. We consider that the principle has not been affected by the fact that this article no longer contains a reference to the articles which follow it. This in no way affects our wholehearted support for the basic principles of economic, social, and cultural rights set forth in these articles. In giving our approval to the Declaration today, it is of primary importance that we keep clearly in mind the basic character of the document. It is not a treaty, it is not an international agreement, it is not and does not purport to be a statement of law or of legal obligation. It is a declaration of basic principles of human rights and freedoms to be stamped with the approval of the General Assembly by formal vote of its members and to serve as a common standard of achievement for all peoples of all nations. We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. We hope its proclamation by the General Assembly will be an event comparable to the proclamation of the Declaration of the Rights of Man by the French people in 1789, the adoption of the Bill of Rights by the people of the United States, and the adoption of comparable declarations at different times in other countries, at a time when there are so many issues on which we find it difficult to reach a common basis of agreement. It is a significant fact that 58 states have found such a large measure of agreement in the complex field of human rights. This must be taken as testimony of our common aspiration, first voiced in the Charter of the United Nations, to lift men everywhere to a higher standard of life and to a greater enjoyment of freedom. Man's desire for peace lies behind this declaration. The realization 
that the flagrant violation of human rights by Nazi and fascist countries sowed the seeds of the last world war has supplied the impetus for the work which brings us to the moment of achievement here today. In a recent speech in Canada, Gladstone Murray said, the central fact is that man is fundamentally a moral being, that the light we have is imperfect, does not matter so long as we are always trying to improve it. We are equal in sharing the moral freedom that distinguishes us as men. Man's status makes each individual an end in himself. No man is by nature simply the servant of the state or of another man. The ideal and fact of freedom and not technology are the true distinguishing marks of our civilization. This declaration is based upon the spiritual fact that man must have freedom in which to develop his full stature and through common effort to raise the level of human dignity. We have much to do to fully achieve and to assure the rights set forth in this declaration, but having them put before us with the moral backing of 58 nations will be a great step forward. As we here bring to fruition our labors on this Declaration of Human Rights, we must at the same time rededicate ourselves to the unfinished task which lies before us. We can now move on with new courage and inspiration to the completion of an international covenant on human rights and of measures for the implementation of human rights. In conclusion, I feel that I cannot do better than to repeat the call to action by Secretary Marshall in his opening statement to this assembly. Let this third regular session of the General Assembly approve by an overwhelming majority the Declaration of Human Rights as a standard of conduct for all. And let us, as members of the United Nations, conscious of our own shortcomings and imperfections, join our effort in good faith to live up to this high standard. That was First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt's Declaration of Human Rights speech delivered in Paris, France, on December 9, 1948. I'm Alan Chartok, and you're listening to The Power of Words, a year-long series of programs that follows American history throughout some of the most memorable and inspiring political speeches of our time. Joining us on the program today is Dr. Alita Black, Professor of History and International Affairs at the George Washington University, author and project director and editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers. Well, welcome back, Alita Black, and I, I wanted to start with this. You told us before we went into the speech that this speech was written by the State Department types and others for her. Did she fight back against any of that? Yes, but not in this speech. She gave a major speech in Paris that's called The Future of Human Rights, and she gave it at the Sorbonne right when the General Assembly was convening to vote on the different drafts of the Declaration. And she fought back hard on that. I mean, big time hard on that, and in fact gave the speech in French and deviated significantly from the prepared text. In this speech, the State Department drew on Eleanor's own comments in committee and really, you know, used the points that she would make, but made this address a much more Western address than Eleanor would have had she had control of the remarks herself. Now, her husband was dead. She was obviously put there by Harry Truman. What was that relationship like? Well, the great story about this is that Jimmy Burns, think the Jesse Helms of his day, wanted Eleanor out of the country because Eleanor had become such a pronounced and profound critic of Harry Truman by the fall of 1945. And Burns, because we, I'm sorry, Alita, and, and Burns' role at that time for everybody's listening was? 
He was a special advisor to Harry Truman and had done great work on the Reconstruction Finance Committee and the Commerce Department and at one point had been an associate justice on the United States Supreme Court. And so he was the really anti-New Dealer, profoundly Southern Democrat, who was Truman's close political advisor in 1945. And he, to put it bluntly, did not like Eleanor Roosevelt. And he saw Eleanor's criticism of Harry Truman as he meandered all over the political map at the end of 1945 on issues like full employment and wage and rent controls and food and price controls as undermining the president's stature because at that point everybody with an IQ over two was lining up to run for president against Harry Truman in 1948. And so the way to help Truman really regain some of his presidential stature was to get Eleanor out of the country, take credit for sending Eleanor out of the country so that he could, quote unquote, get some of that Roosevelt stardust on him. And so it is the strategy to send Eleanor to the U.N. so that you can say, oh, I'm continuing the Roosevelt legacy with the U.N. and I'm so magnanimous. I'm sending my greatest critic out of the country where hopefully she would not continue to be a thorn on my side. Well, lo and behold, Eleanor Roosevelt once again broke the mold because she not only was an instructed delegate to the United States delegation, but she also was a political pundit. She kept writing My Day the whole time that she was there. So while she's on the floor of the U.N. and in committee, she is representing Truman State Department and trying to, behind the scenes, push it to be more encompassing. And then she comes home and writes her column about what she thinks the world should be. So tell me, how did her notices go after she gave this speech? Well, they, they were incredible because by my day, she had used her column to set the stage for this speech. Really, the last, uh, if you start looking at my day in December of 1948, and if I may make a plug, they're all on the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers website, www.gwu.edu slash erpapers. You can see how Eleanor really was using her column to explain the individual articles in the Declaration the battle that it took to get it drafted and all of the different versions approved, and to really draw her readers' attention to this really eventful day. And Eleanor Roosevelt at that time was the third most syndicated columnist in the United States. So this was a a huge undertaking. And so when Eleanor takes the rostrum to talk about the Declaration as the Magna Carta for all humankind and the equivalent of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, the UN and all of its delegates and employees understood the depth of her conviction to that and how long she had worked to make this happen and that, in fact, she was the one essential person to the Declaration's completion. And so when she gave this speech, the United Nations, for the first time, the first time in the history of the United Nations, stood and gave a standing ovation. Because as the Secretary General declared, you know, without her deft leadership, this never would have happened. And so the speech reverberated throughout the UN, but it reverberated more for the women who gave it and their knowledge of her sacrifice and her unwavering conviction to these principles than it was really for what she said. If you want to look in the United States about how it played, the United States saw it as somewhat of a relief because America had achieved a great victory within the UN. It was clearly tied, um, linked to our own Declaration of Independence, 
which of course does not include social, economic, and cultural rights in it. And so it is a way to present the Declaration in a way that would make it more palpable at home because there was huge opposition to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights within the United States. I mean, the American Bar Association was opposed to it because everybody thought incorrectly that it would mean, it would require that every constitution be totally rewritten to comply to these principles. And it's a declaration. It's not a covenant. And Eleanor would spend the rest of her life championing covenants, which are legally binding treaties that were specifically designed to implement the articles contained in the Declaration. How much of a feminist would you say, and how important to the growing feminist movement at the time, would you say Eleanor Roosevelt was? Eleanor Roosevelt was the Gloria Steinem of her time without the language. I mean, Eleanor understood how important her presence as a woman and the only woman in the American delegation was. And she certainly understood the power that women must wield within the United Nations if, in fact, women's rights were to be included in the Declaration. And Eleanor, from an early age, for example, her first book as First Lady is entitled It's Up to the Women. I mean, Eleanor knew that there could be no separation of human rights by gender. She thought that women's rights were human rights and human rights or women's rights, just as Secretary Clinton will so powerfully state in 1995 in Beijing. I mean, Eleanor um, would not use the term women's human rights, but she made sure that all countries understood the critical importance that having women on their delegation would play in developing their public policy. And Eleanor, when she traveled around the world, and she went around the world three times to promote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, took great pains to meet with what we would call NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and women's groups around the world, and would bring up women's rights in meetings with heads of state wherever she traveled. So in Eleanor's own words, she said, I became much more of a feminist than I ever imagined. How tough was she? I know you've spoken of this earlier, but there's a story that has made her perhaps apocryphal, I don't know, about a confrontation she had years later with Bobby Kennedy in New York politics and how tough she was there, in which Kennedy's reaction was allegedly not nice to her and some name calling. How tough was the lady? Eleanor was tough. I mean, tough as nails. I only wish that Arthur Schlesinger Jr. was still alive to respond to this because when um, I asked Professor Schlesinger that once, he started laughing and he said, oh, my dear, she was an amazing political war horse. She had armor and entered the fray gripped for battle. And Eleanor understood that politics was tough. And that's why she didn't encourage women to get in it unless they really had been battle tested. I mean, Eleanor was called every name under the planet. She survived assassination attempts. Really? There were threats, uh, attempts, attempts. I mean, the Klan put the largest bounty in its history on her head. $25,000. J. Edgar Hoover wanted to strip her of her citizenship and declare her quote-unquote colored and sent to Liberia to live with her people, quote-unquote. Eleanor understood that people called her a communist. They called her a socialist. Many people called her the Antichrist. I mean, she understood how to stay in the battle and not take it personal. But when they went after her children or they went after her friends, then she became a full tank in motion. So to go back to your Kennedy metaphor, yes, they fought. And yes, there were names exchanged. And I think that one of the great testaments to her political influence in 1960 was even after John Kennedy had won 
the nomination in August of 1960. He goes to Hyde Park to see Eleanor Roosevelt. In theory, it is to give the address for the 25th anniversary of the adoption of Social Security, but what he actually does is pay a courtesy call on Eleanor in her Valkyl cottage where they talk about the election. And she basically says to John Kennedy, you know, if you want to say anything, you can communicate through my sons. And to win, you cannot rely on new Democrats. This is going to be a very close election because, in fact, your religion will, in fact, be a major issue. And so to offset the anti-Catholic vote, you're going to have to deal with the African-American vote and the labor vote all of which Kennedy was in jeopardy of losing because of Bobby Kennedy's investigations of Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters and of John Kennedy's equivocation on civil rights legislation when he was a member of Congress. So it's only after John Kennedy decides to attend a conference in Harlem against the advice of his advisors to accept recommendations from Eleanor Roosevelt and Martin Luther King and Herbert Lehman on desegregation of housing and schools. And he issues his famous proclamation that he will desegregate federally financed housing with one stroke of the pen should he be elected, that Eleanor agrees to campaign for him. And then she goes to 16 cities. And where does she go? African-American churches, NAACP meetings, labor union halls, and stands outside of organized factories to, in fact, lobby for John Kennedy. And as we all know, Kennedy wins because he wins Illinois. And there are 224,000 African-American votes in the city of Chicago. And Eleanor Roosevelt spent a lot of time getting those votes. So I would say she's a huge political player. How important was she in terms of an icon for the African-American community? Well, Eleanor had an amazing relationship with the African-American community and African-American leadership. People understood the attempts on her life for the positions that she advocated. Certainly, you know, people want to talk about the Tuskegee Airmen as an example or the Marian Anderson concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial as an example. But Eleanor Roosevelt had heartfelt commitments to race long before those two very famous public events happened. And in fact, I think that you can show the depth of her respect is that uh, most people in Eleanor's own age group called her Mrs. R. Very few people would take the liberty that I'm taking right now to call her Eleanor. And the two people who addressed letters to her and who called her Eleanor to her face were Walter White and Mary McLeod Bethune. Walter White was executive secretary of the NAACP, and Mary McLeod Bethune was the founder of the National Council of Negro Women, the founder of Bethune-Cookman College, and was director of the minority division of the National Youth Administration. And they were devoted friends. And most of Mrs. Roosevelt's peers, in fact, the vast majority of them, did not take the liberty of calling her Eleanor, and Eleanor did not ask them to call her Eleanor. (laughs) With Bethune and White, they called each other by their first names and only called each other Mr. White and Dr. Bethune and Mrs. Roosevelt in public. They were devoted to one another. And Eleanor was on the board of directors of the NAACP. She chaired what would become the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. She used my day to advocate for civil rights in her own plain spoken terms and to defend NAACP leadership and other civil rights leadership when they came under attack. And in fact, the FBI, your listeners might be interested to hear, has the largest file on Eleanor Roosevelt up until her death. 4,000 pages, and the vast majority of that, 99% of that, is related to her civil rights activity. And she was so outspoken on race that, as I said earlier, 
J. Edgar Hoover thought she was quote-unquote mulatto and therefore had to be a communist and therefore had to be shipped out of the country. So her stance on civil rights as human rights, just as women's rights are human rights, is indivisible. How did she do with Ike? Well, she liked Eisenhower. As a general, she thought he did an extraordinary work. She thought he was great in NATO, and she thought he did a good job as president of Columbia. She just wasn't very fond of him as a president in the early days. That had to do mainly with his intense opposition to the United Nations, his intense opposition to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and his appointment of Richard Nixon vice president, because Eleanor detested Richard Nixon, detested him, and thought that Richard Nixon, along with Joseph McCarthy, were the two most dangerous people in American politics. And so the fact that Ike would stay with Nixon and not defend George Marshall were two cardinal sins in Eleanor's book. But she did think very highly of his farewell address in which he spoke of the military-industrial complex. But to talk about Ike and race, Eleanor is so frustrated with Eisenhower's position on Brown that in the midst of the struggle to integrate Little Rock Central High School and Eisenhower's refusal to get involved in that, she calls him A-W-O-L. She says, General, I mean, Mr. President, as a general, you understood the field of battle, but now as president, you are absent without leave in the major battle of our time. So she effectively calls Eisenhower a coward on civil rights. I would say that for those listeners who really want Eleanor's heartfelt understanding of human rights is that you should refer to this, which is where, after all, the universal human rights begin, in small places close to home, in the field, the factory, the farm that they attend, in the church, in the synagogue. Those are the places where universal human rights have meaning. And unless they have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. And without concerted citizen action, they will disappear. That's Eleanor Roosevelt from her heart on human rights. Wow. I could go on listening forever to our wonderful speaker, Dr. Alita Black, professor of history and international affairs at the George Washington University author, project director, and editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers. Thanks also to our wonderful producer, David Gustina, who's done all the hard work here, the FDR Library and Museum for providing the speech, and a special thank you to Bob Bullock from the New York State Archives Partnership Trust. Remember, you can listen to any of our programs online at wamc.org. And be sure to join us next time for another discussion about a great political speech on the power of words. Support for the power of words comes from the New York State Archives Partnership Trust, helping to preserve more than 380 years of New York's documentary heritage. www.nysarchives.org New York State Council for the Humanities, online at nyhumanities.org and EYP Architecture and Engineering, committed to preserving and restoring our nation's most prominent landmark facilities. www.eypae.com or 518-431-3300.